thank you for joining us for today's lecture. I'm Asma Escaron, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center for Global Security Research located within the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I'll be moderating today's lecture, which is called China's Climate Security Vulnerabilities, Implications for the United States. Our speaker today is Aaron Sikorsky. Aaron is the Director of the Center for Climate and Security she also leads the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Prior to her current position, she worked as a senior analyst in the U.S. intelligence community for over a decade. And in her last position in the IC, she served as deputy director of the Strategic Futures Group on the National Intelligence Council. Erin's talk today is based on a paper she recently published, which details China's climate vulnerabilities. You can find it on the Center for Climate Security's website. We'll also include a link in the chat. In terms of format, Erin will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll turn to the audience for the question and answer session. Erin, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today at CGSR. Welcome. I'll turn over to you so you can get the lecture started. Great. Well, thank you so much, Esmeret. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the lab. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to a lot of the national labs in the past year or so, and I really love the questions I get. So I'm looking forward to the to the conversation today. Um, I do have some slides which I'll use to walk through the conversation, but um, I'm going to start just at the very broad level, kind of where we're at um, in terms of the climate security conversation and the hazards before digging in to the China piece in particular. Um, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page, right? As we approach the Conference of Parties meetings coming up later this month in early December in the UAE, um, we're at a moment where it's becoming increasingly clear that the gap between, you know, what countries have promised in terms of cutting emissions and what is needed to reach the goals that we've set out in the Paris Agreement and elsewhere, staying well below two degrees Celsius, right? That that gap is is large, and we're unlikely frankly, to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. And this graph here you see, I could have picked, you know, many different reports to illustrate this, but this is one from the UN Environment Program that was released last year. Uh, and I, I highlight this just to say that the world in which we are operating over the next couple of decades is a world of continued warming then, right, and increasing climate hazards. And we, when we think about competition with China, when we think about the national security landscape, taking this into account is really important and recognizing this because certainly China recognizes it, right? And so that um, background, I think, is important that we're in a moment where some climate impacts are already irreversible and we need to think about operating in a world of hazards that are more intense, more frequent, and more widespread. And there isn't a country around the world that isn't going to have to deal with these at some level, right? And so when we think about China, and when we think about it as what the Secretary of Defense has called the pacing threat for the United States, we also have to think about climate change because if we don't, we're gonna miss things or get things wrong in how we think about this competition and about um, the US opportunities and risks that we face. So, when we talk about climate security at the Center for Climate and Security where I work, um, I, we usually break it down into three different primary pathways through which climate change can cause uh, national security risks. And I want to touch on these briefly, again, before diving into how China is affected uh, specifically. But the risk pathways we usually look at, we start with the direct risks, right? The risks of the hazards themselves to critical infrastructure and military readiness. This is everything from, you know, military bases on the Gulf Coast or say in, in California that have been affected either by hurricanes or wildfires. Uh, it's critical infrastructure like uh, manufacturing or electricity infrastructure, right? It's how the hazards that, that kind of direct disaster risk. Uh, those are important risks certainly, but they're also the most straightforward and the ones that I think many countries are, are poised to um, deal with uh, most in, in a straightforward way. The second and third buckets of risk or pathways are more complex. And these, I would say, are the indirect risks uh, to security posed by climate change. 
The second bucket is internal to states, right? How climate change intersects with other developments to affect state fragility and risks of conflict. Rarely is it climate change alone that would drive these risks, but it's climate hazards layered on top of other uh, existing risks or dynamics within a country. There's been a lot of academic literature that looks at this bucket of risk. Um, I would say, generally speaking, we have perhaps underestimated some of these risks. There's a lot, I think, a spotlight effect that focuses a lot on places that are already fragile, like the Sahel, for example, or East Africa. Um, but I think more middle income countries and even high income countries like the United States, <coughs> excuse me, face some risks in this in this bucket. And then the third bucket goes beyond states borders, right? How climate change is shaping geopolitical competition, access to resources uh, between and among states. This can be food and water. This can be uh, clean energy it inputs, things needed for the clean energy transition. Uh, it can be access to new geographies like the Arctic, for example. Um, so climate creates security risks here. And when we think about framing these risks, uh, sometimes when I talk to policymakers or talk to folks in the national security community, I'll get the question, okay, well, is climate change more of a risk than China, right? How, if you're gonna name the top 10 risks facing the United States, how do, you, how do you rank it? Or they approach it in kind of an all or nothing manner. Well, if we take action on climate or we focus on climate, that takes away from our ability to focus on China. And I would argue that's the wrong framing for understanding the climate change dynamic. Um, whereas the right approach is to think about climate as a systemic risk and a shaping force, right? That is really affecting all sorts of different things. So the right question to ask vis-a-vis -vis China is how does climate change shape Chinese national interests, right? How does it shape opportunities and, and challenges for the United States vis-a-vis -vis China? How does it shape China's relationships with neighbors like India and Pakistan, right? Um, so looking at it systemically is an approach that will get you better answers and, and help you really understand and manage. And that, that approach gives you then a chance to think about opportunities as well. Where are their co-benefits when we take action on something like climate change, whether it's investing in climate adaptation for countries in the global south, key allies and partners of the United States, whether it's investing here at home in the clean energy transition, how can that benefit us as we think about our competition and relationship with China is an important way to think about it. So those are some kind of broad remarks to just frame this, this more specific conversation on, on China itself. So I have a quote here and I used it in the paper as well from Mao Zedong, man must conquer nature which I think, you know, if you take nothing else away from this conversation, I think that mindset uh, really shapes the Chinese uh, thinking, the Chinese government thinking and response to, to climate. And you'll see that um, as illustrated in, in my remarks. I'm gonna cover four things when, I, when we talk about China today. First, we're gonna talk about the country's vulnerability. Well, first, I'm actually gonna talk about how climate fits into China's national security vision. Then I'm gonna talk about China's vulnerabilities, how the country's responding to those vulnerabilities and where some areas of uncertainty are. And then finally, the considerations given this for the United States going forward. So overall, in terms of the national security vision, right, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, China's adopted a very broad concept of national security that encompasses internal and external, traditional and non-traditional threats. The CCP's conception of, quote, holistic national security, which was first outlined in 2014, includes environmental security and resource security as two of its 11 components. When you look at the military itself, it's a little less clear the extent to which ecological and climate security topics have permeated their strategy and their doctrine. But you can look at public documents and statements that provide at least some indication that they're taking these issues into account. There's some internal debate over the extent to which they should focus on these issues. There's also some focus on green technology for the military. Clearly, the, the PLA and the People's Armed, Armed Police are very involved in a lot of internal uh, disaster response in, in China. 
And there are some indications that PLA leaders are worried that the military is having to spend too much time focused on uh, national response to disasters. I'll say the Chinese military isn't alone in, in this thinking. We saw just this summer actually in Canada, for example, with their military having to be deployed in response to wildfires like never before, a lot of public debate about uh, whether that's the right use of the military and if they need different or new institutions to help manage this. So this is something that many countries are, are grappling with. So that's kind of the big picture of how, how China looks at it. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't, to look at some of these holistic national security documents and see the language they use to talk about ecological and environmental uh, security, because it's much different, frankly, than uh, we in the United States and elsewhere have traditionally looked at, at these issues. So what are China's vulnerabilities? Just like those three buckets I, I laid out in the previous slide, um, they have risks across those three buckets as well. And as I talk about uh, both the vulnerabilities and their response today, I'm going to use some examples uh, from Typhoon Doksuri, which hit the country this summer. Um, so that's not in the paper because the paper was published last year, but I think is actually very il illustrative of many of the uh, points I make in the paper. So for just to refresh memories, you know, in late July, Typhoon Doksuri and its remnants brought torrential rains, which flooded the Chinese capital of Beijing and other areas of the Northeast. You know, the amount of rain that fell in a five-day period was the most ever recorded since 1883 in the country. The water displaced millions and destroyed thousands of homes and hectares of farmland. So it was a very intense uh, hazard um, and, again, illustrates some of these vulnerabilities. So the first vulner bucket of vulnerability, right, are these direct risks, like I outlined, to military and critical infrastructure. And one of the examples um, that I give in the paper, and you see here on this slide, is comparing uh, potential sea level rise, which is the, the larger map there. This comes from Climate Central, and it's uh, the red areas show land that would be underwater due to sea level rise and annual floods by 2060 if we continue on kind of an unchecked uh, emissions trajectory. And if you overlay that area underwater with Chinese major Chinese shipyards, which is the inset map, you see that there is <laughs> some serious overlap there, which is an example of the type of infrastructure risk uh, China, China faces. Of course, it's more than just that. There are also things like the uh, man-made islands they have built in the South China Sea. Uh, as typhoons are slated to strengthen in that region, those islands are particularly vulnerable in large part because of how they've been built um, in a way that destroyed the, the natural reefs that would protect or slow down storms. You've got melting permafrost issues that China has to deal with, uh, with railroads and pipelines, railroads particularly uh, near the border with India where there have been clashes in, in recent years and the railroads they rely on bringing troops and equipment uh, to that area. Also their river deltas, as discussed by this map a bit, um, are also where large populations are, right? So they have a lot of direct infrastructure uh, and, and military risks there. The second area of risk that China, China faces is the, are the compounding risks to domestic stability, right? We expect that climate change will threaten China's economic growth, its food and water security, and its efforts at poverty eradication, and will likely exacerbate inequality within the country. Uh, and the risks here go in both directions, right? The country's continued poverty and inequality make it more vulnerable to climate hazards, but also climate hazards will further exacerbate poverty and, and inequality. Uh, and on a lot of academic work that's been done, looking at how a climate hazard can turn into a climate security vulnerability for a country, right? Some of the key, uh, key factors are um, uh, inequality, right? And lack of capacity by the government to respond. And I think these are areas in which uh, China will be strained as, as uh, climate hazards continued. Um, Doc Suri is another example of this. You can look at the impact it had on food production in China. Three of the hardest hit provinces by Daksuri form what is known as China's granary and are responsible for one fifth of the country's grain output. And what's 
particularly of note here is these provinces and the country overall when looking at at food security wasn't just dealing with Doc Suri, it's dealing with the layering of multiple climate hazards over years, right? The previous year, or excuse me, earlier in the summer in June and July, the country faced record heat waves that stunted crops such as soybean and corn. It also had prior to Doc Suri, the most destructive rain event in a decade for wheat crops in Henan province. And after the Doc Suri, uh, farmers in Northeast China were posting videos on social media begging for help in managing the after effects of the flooding, including the risks of pests. And there was a lot of um, tension between rural and urban areas within the country of who was getting uh, the response from the government and a lot of farmers and communities feeling like they weren't getting responses that layered on top of tensions that had been growing with um, uh, in rural areas and, and farmers generally, right? So it wasn't climate alone, but it was the other political dynamics. The third uh, area of vulnerability for China are the external geopolitical risks as well, particularly the role that climate will play in likely amplifying tensions in the Indo-Pacific with its neighbors, right? It's going to, uh, climate's going to impact key resources that China shares with its neighbors, such as freshwater river basins and ocean fish stocks. I also, we also assess that if China remains on a path of heavy fossil fuel consumption in coming years, that's going to contribute to tensions with poorer countries, not only in the region, but I think globally, um, especially as those poorer countries feel the brunt of climate impacts. And we saw this a bit already at the COP meeting in Egypt last year, where for the first time, we saw some developing island nations willing to call out China publicly for its uh, continued high emissions and saying that you know China probably owes something as well to developing countries in terms of loss and damage and reparations for its ongoing uh, emissions, which was a new development, frankly, because generally speaking, you know China is is classified as a um, as a developing country per the uh, Paris Agreement, right? Dif uh, it has differentiated uh, responsibilities because over time it is not emitted as much, but now that it it continues to be the highest emitter, um, it's, it's facing more criticism. So, so those geopolitical tensions are something that China has to contend with as well. So what is China's response to all of this, right? They are not unaware of, of these vulnerabilities. And uh, what we argue in the paper is that their approach to these risks largely mirrors their approach to other perceived major challenges, right? First, the country's pursuing major infrastructure and public works interventions while boosting their disaster response capabilities, including within the military. Second, they're attempting to control, muzzle, and minimize public critiques or concerns. And then on the international front, they're really trying to take advantage of the issue to advance their position vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors and in competition with the United States. So despite that criticism last year, they're generally trying to cast themselves as a leader and partner on climate concerns on the world stage. So let me take each of these three in turn to give some examples. And again, point, point to Doc Suri here a bit. Um, so first, on the investment in innovation, adaptation, and disaster response, they focused heavily on adaptation for nearly two decades. They released their first national climate adaptation strategy in 2013. I would note the United States still does not have a national climate adaptation strategy, although the Biden administration has taken some steps towards one. Um, the latest uh, national adaptation strategy from China was released in June of 2022. And in that document, they state the country will be, quote, basically a climate resilient society by 2035. Strategy is comprehensive and focuses heavily on technical fixes and exerting control over the environment. Back to that Mao Zedong quote, man must control nature, right? It's hard to overstate the scale of some of these infrastructure projects. The South to North Water Diversion Project, for example, is the most expensive and expansive infrastructure project in the country since 1949. And it's designed to bring water from the wet South to the dry North. Uh, as I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, when we look at some uncertainties in their response, it's unclear that this massive adaptation strategy, frankly, as big as it is, is even enough and it misses some of the softer, um, less uh, tangible sides of resilience. But, but it is a huge focus 
for them and they're hugely investing at a massive scale. Uh, the second area of response, again, unsurprising, is this minimizing dissent, controlling public responses and perceptions, a key tool in their toolbox uh, for preventing social and political unrest is the suppression of criticism or opposing voices, right? Not surprising. An example of this is in 2021 in Henan province in the central part of China. That province receives the heaviest single hour of rainfall ever recorded in a major city globally. It resulted in devastating floods. And many of you probably saw, you know, what were frankly pretty horrific pictures of folks stuck in subway cars where the water was, was rising, right? In the wake of this event, the government acted extremely quickly to remove all social media posts critical of its response and actually then launched a campaign to spur harassment and attention on foreign journalists that were covering the event to distract from failures. And it actually led to some kind of local mob attacks against journalists from the BBC and others who were trying to cover what was happening. We've seen a similar response in the wake to, of um, the flooding in, uh, excuse me, after Typhoon Daksuri where the premier uh, made public statements in China talking about maintaining the stability of soci society in their response. And we saw social media posts that were critical of the Chinese government response being deleted almost immediately online. The third area of China's response then is again, trying to take advantage on the world stage, leveraging climate concerns abroad, trying to portray itself as a key partner on climate adaptation for other countries to preempt criticism about its own emissions and to try and contrast itself with the United States. You know, it, it touts its South to South cooperation, its sharing of adaptation, um, innovations with other countries. And then the recent expansion earlier this year of the BRICS Alliance, right, which is an alliance of global South countries that China has led. Um, they grew in size uh, significantly this year. It had more, more countries applying to join the BRICS than actually were accepted. And uh, climate investment and adaptation was a key piece of it. And we're seeing this in the lead up to the COP meeting in UAE as well, where China is taking every opportunity to note that the United States and other Western countries are not living up to their commitments in terms of climate finance and that they should be. I think, again, this is a tricky area for China, or becoming more tricky as, as um, its emissions continue to stay at a high level. It's harder for them to hold that high moral ground, but it is an area in which they're, they're pushing forward. So, you know, this, the response is, is, I think, fairly clear-eyed from China. They recognize these risks, um, and they recognize that they need to operate in a warmed world, and they're often credited, I think, publicly with better integrating a long-term approach, right, to its strategic planning than countries in the West. And certainly some of these responses are ahead of the curve, right? Like I mentioned, they have a national climate adaptation plan. The United States does not. They've invested in icebreakers for the Arctic, right? They call themselves a near Arctic country and are pushing to get more of a foothold there. They've positioned themselves to dominate the market for critical minerals and clean energy infrastructure. And they've developed, as I've said, these decades long detailed adaptation and mitigation strategies. Despite all of this, I think there are still uncertainties about the trajectory of their climate security landscape and in two key areas. There are tensions, I think, between politics and strategic planning within the country and the adequacy, frankly, of its adaptation planning. So let me take the first one, which I like to call competence versus politics, right? And I think here you see uh, the, the COVID-19 response really exemplifies this tension for the country. For China, in the wake of the 2007 SARS crisis, they developed a very sophisticated emergency response law. It, it created a tiered response of coordination at the local level of all resources built a national early warning system for infectious disease. On paper, they had a, a brilliant approach for how to manage this, uh, but they didn't implement it when, when COVID-19 erupted because of political considerations preventing the implementation of such a response. There are no political incentives in China to report up negative news up the chain of command, right? So the initial outbreak in Wuhan was covered up and minimized. They were not able to follow 
the plan they had on paper because there was no political local incentive to do so. And I think you see similar political dynamics at play in how they're responding to climate hazards. You know, on the one hand, they've built relatively sophisticated flood and drought management programs. But on the other, you know, I think was, there's a quote from a Chinese professor in the Washington Post last year where he said, meteorological departments often worry about being held responsible for predicting a severe event that doesn't materialize, especially because local governments want a clear yes or no answer. So there was, you know, there's not an incentive to use the early warning systems that they have in place. Um, similarly, in the wake of Typhoon Doc Suri, there was some really interesting reporting about how local rescue teams were waiting for invitation letters before deploying due to Chinese political regulations. They had to have an invitation letter from local governments, but the official seals for the invitations were lost in the flood, so the local governments were unable to issue them. Similarly, before Xi Jinping ordered action on flood control and relief at the national level, local officials, quote, didn't dare take charge, according to a local expert, right? So you've got these political considerations that hamper the response. And I think as hazards become more intense, right, as there's more and more to respond to, that tension is going to prevent uh, full implementation of some of their plans. You see it on the energy transition as well, the tension between local incentives to keep the economy running uh, versus you know, regulations of what they're supposed to be doing in transitioning to clean energy. The other piece is you know, the ad how adequate really are the physical adaptation measures, right? Some experts have argued that China's adopted this intensive adaptation focus because it views mitigation as unrealistic as it tries to meet its goals of economic growth. Um, but I think there are limits to such a strategy, right? We can't adapt our way out of a four, five, six degree increase in temperature. And even now, the physical hazards from climate change are coming sooner and more intensely and more frequently than even models have predicted. So even China's monumental investments may not be enough. Um, and again, these disincentives for reporting up bad news, it's possible that some threats they already face around water insecurity, right, are actually already worse than, than they've assessed and, and, and planned for. And you saw a little bit of this uh, in the, um, in, in the typhoon Doxuri, wake of the typhoon as well. The country has their sponge city strategy where they've spent billions of dollars of green infrastructure to soak up heavy precipitation in cities. But we saw this as actually unequal to these historic downpours. And there was uh, quotes in, in Bloomberg News after, from an expert after the flooding saying that water management designs under the strategy were based on rainfall levels in the 30 years prior to 2014. So in other words, sponge cities were not designed for today's extreme events, much less ones in the future. I've seen some um, back and forth on this where some experts say, actually, the sponge cities did a pretty good job and it would have been much, much worse. Um, but others saying, no, no, they were designed uh, poorly. And so, but I think, again, it just speaks to the fact that physical infrastructure alone is not enough to adapt. And a lot of work that's been done on how do you build resilience, including by you know, here in the US, the Director of National Intelligence through the Global Trends Program has noted that resilient states are ones that invest not only in infrastructure, but also in relationships, in people, in trust in government, right? All of these things are going to be equally critical to navigating uh, a climate change world. And clearly, China is not um, investing in, in those pieces. All right. So what does all this mean for the United States? and the West. And what we looked at in the paper were kind of four areas. One was this idea of um, being prepared to compete in new frontiers, right? That uh, I mentioned the Arctic earlier, uh, we mentioned critical minerals and the clean energy transition. Uh, I think food and water security are another place we need to think about. Um, how are we going to think about competition with China? Um, where China is going to be looking to compete and how do we position ourselves? And I think in the U.S. we're starting, we're seeing, you know, some recognition of that, the framing of the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, right, this kind of industrial policy here within the U.S., these 
thorny questions about critical minerals mining, mining and how we approach that um, are all coming to the fore. But the second uh, takeaway then is not only are we competing in these new frontiers, but there are very few set rules of the road <laughs> in a lot of these frontiers. And part of the competition is a, around being the ones to set the rules of the road, right? Uh, talking about deep seabed mining, for example, that's an area where China has been very active. Um, we can talk about, you know, IUU fishing, um, access in the Arctic. These are all places in which uh, China is looking to be the one to set the rules of the game um, in, in their favor and something the United States needs to be prepared for. Uh, at the same time, we need to think carefully about our relations with our allies and partners. Um, what I have on here, it's a little bit outdated now, but is a survey from 2019-2020 of ASEAN member states asking them, you know, what are your top three challenges? And in that black box there, uh, I compare the, the numbers for concerns about risks of military tensions versus concerns of risks from uh, climate change. And for many countries, almost all, I think, except uh, maybe Malaysia, there's more concern about climate issues than there is about military tensions. And so the thing that uh, US allies and partners, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, are hyper-focused on is being, building resilience to climate hazards. And so that is a place where the United States can show up and show that it's, it's committed to these investments, not only because it's what those countries want and it's the right thing to do, but also when we think about what we might want to call on those countries for in the case of say the worst, you know, uh, a conflict in the Indo-Pacific over Taiwan, for example, um, places where we're building military bases or leveraging military bases like Papua New Guinea, right? If those countries don't have resilience and food and water security, then our military can't, uh, will we'll be in a world of hurt when we go to rely on them, right? So it's in our national security interests. There's a place where you have co-benefits, right? Helping them build resilience to climate change not only gets after what they want, but it also potentially helps us. Um, and this is also a part, uh, you know, regarding leadership in the developing world and showing that the U.S. is is willing willing to show up. Um, and the last thing I'll say here that's not in these bullets, but I think is really important in a national security context is as we think about, you know, China's potential vulnerabilities or U.S. opportunities, really digging in and better understanding those risks that I started with, I think will pay a lot of dividends um, in our understanding of China's vulnerabilities and, and China's strength. Um, you know, every year the Department of Defense has to provide a report to Congress on the status of the Chinese military. And you look at that report in recent years, there's barely any mention of climate in it. And I think that's a real oversight because I think understanding how climate will affect Chinese military posture, Chinese military um, infrastructure and strategy in the same way that our military is frankly doing a very good job now at looking at these issues for the US, um, looking at it for our co competitors and adversaries is important as well. So uh, that's been a lot of me talking at all of you. Uh, I'm going to pause there, I think, and turn it back over to Asmaret to uh, uh, manage a, a Q&A. But I'm really interested in hearing your questions and, and comments on this work. Thank you.